My name is Nigel Lee Wilson and I'm going to lead a short act of worship for today's service, Sunday the 13th of February 2022. We are continuing our series on what the church is and today we think about the part that each of us have to play in the church of God and each of us, every person, no matter how old or young, no matter how new to the faith or if, if you've been walking with Jesus for 50 years, we are all part of this body of Christ and each part is valuable. An opening prayer. Let everything be said and done in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through Jesus Christ. Sing psalms, hymns and sacred songs. Let us sing to God with thankful hearts. Open our lips, Lord, and we shall praise your name. And now a time of confession. When I say, Lord, be merciful, would you reply, forgive us our sin. Lord God, our maker and our redeemer, this is your world and we are your people. Come among us and save us. We have willfully misused your gifts of creation. Lord be merciful, forgive us our sin. We have seen the ill treatment of others and have not gone to their aid. Lord be merciful, forgive us our sin. We have condoned evil and dishonesty and failed to strive for justice. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. We have heard the good news of Christ, but have failed to share it with others. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. We have not loved you with all our heart, nor our neighbours as ourselves. Lord, be merciful, forgive us our sin. May God, who loved the world so much that he sent his Son to be our Saviour, forgive us our sins and make us holy to serve him in the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now we come to a time of hearing from God's Word and I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 12. So if you've got a Bible, please turn to it. It's a wonderful chapter with two main sections of teaching. The first 11 verses is spiritual gifts and then the remaining verses up to 31 is talking about the body, one body in many parts. We're going to be studying the first 11 verses uh, this morning. Paul writes, Now, about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another 
miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he gives them to each one, just as he determines. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Every year, certainly up until Covid struck, St Helen's College has held a faith fair. And at the college faith fair, there is a marketplace in the main reception area where different faiths speak to students one to one during the morning session. And as, it, as you'd expect, there's a variety of stalls. There are Mormons, Buddhists, atheists, Muslims, Christians, and others from time to time. And we normally go along with the offer of free New Testaments and then at lunchtime, the representatives of the different faiths have a really friendly buffet lunch together, courtesy of St. Helens College. And after that, there's a question and answer session where students can ask any question that they like. Now, Paul, the apostle, was in the marketplace at Corinth. And he had experience with this kind of bustle and hustle and interplay of ideas. Now, last week, our curate, Debs Davis, spoke from Acts chapters 1 and 2 on the birth of the church. And this coincided with the coming of the Holy Spirit, as we saw. And the church continues the ministry of Jesus after his ascension to heaven. This week in our continuing series on the church, we're looking at part of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. As I said, the whole chapter is wonderful, but we only have time to study the first section this morning. Now, 1 Corinthians means the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, if you're new to the Bible. And it was written to the church at Corinth. It is a town in Greece which still exists today. And here you can see it on a map. As you can see on the map, Corinth is not so far from Athens and it's situated on a narrow neck of land in between the Aegean Sea and the Adriatic Sea. It's a busy seaport on a major trade route and in fact, it was cheaper to drag your boat on rollers across that isthmus than to sail it all the way around the coast. Corinth, that busy intersection point on trade routes running east to west and north south, was well known for its immorality. I visited Corinth a few years ago on a business trip and uh, here is a picture of the marketplace area where Paul would have preached the good news of the gospel and in the background you can see the hill on which stood a temple and when we were there the tour guide showed us a stone area known as the Bema of Saint Paul so if you wanted to share some news you went there into the marketplace and stood on this big piece of stone and shouted out your message to the crowd. And we can imagine, can't we, Paul preaching the good news of Jesus there. But I remember this tour guide saying, you know, look behind you, and there is the hill where there would have been a temple to the goddess of love. And I remember him saying, hundreds of prostitutes would be employed at the temple. Now, some of those who heard Paul and who became believers in Jesus at Corinth might have once been temple prostitutes and their lives had been totally transformed by the living God. We're not sure, 
but it could well have been that this little congregation included women like that and from every other background as well. Let us glance now at chapter one of the letter, just briefly, so we get a glimpse of Paul's heart for this church. Chapter one, verse two. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified, that means made holy, in Christ. Of course, Christ means Messiah or anointed one. Sanctified in Christ, Jesus, and called to be holy together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Then continuing from verse 4, I always thank God for you, Paul writes, because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, listen to this, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. So they didn't lack any spiritual gift. And yet, there were problems in the church at Corinth. Paul writes of divisions, he mentions them in chapter 1. Then, in chapter 11, he even says in verse 17, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. But Paul does not give up on them. That's the thing. Instead, he loves them and wants to guide and correct them so that the church becomes more healthy. It had vitality, but it was somewhat chaotic. So that brings us to the first verse of chapter 12. And the literal Greek that Paul writes goes as follows. Now, about the spiritual matters, brothers, I do not wish you to be ignorant. Our version of the Bible, the NIV, translates this uh, spiritual matters as spiritual gifts. Paul wants the believers at Corinth to be guided, to be well informed about spiritual matters or spiritual gifts. And now, just a slight detour to what Jesus said about his Father and about the Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 11 verse 11, Jesus is recorded as saying this, Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then Though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? We have a generous, wonderfully generous God. And it's, it's a wonderful promise that Jesus makes. Our God is a generous Father who delights to bless his children, and especially when we ask him for the Holy Spirit. Please can I encourage you, as I encourage myself, to ask God for his Holy Spirit today. Whatever stage we're at, however we are feeling, please let us ask him, for he delights to give. Back briefly to the college faith fair, as we answer questions from the students uh, at the faith fair, we're trying to put across our picture of God. And of course, there are competing visions of God about what is actually true about God. 
We've never been asked to bring along visual aids, but I happen to have brought some along today. And I've got two sticks, a big one and a little one. And I've got a big thick rope here. And I've got a bike light here, bike light. Well, what is your picture of God? Uh, the monotheistic religions believe in one God, monotheism. Now, some religions say that God is simple and he stands completely alone like this, like this stick. Just stands alone, put it there. And uh, then what about Jesus? Well, if God stands completely alone, then Jesus is often portrayed as small and somewhat distant from God. So here's a massive almighty stick representing the infinite God. And here is Jesus, just a man. That is often the case. But what about the Bible? What does the Bible teach? As Debs reminded us last week, the Bible teaches that there is one God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God is three in one or triune or a trinity of persons. Yes, that word trinity doesn't appear in the Bible, but the teaching does. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. Yet there are not three gods, but one. And the poet John Donne wrote a sonnet which began with these words, Batter my heart, three-personed God. That poignant phrase, three-personed God. Now, every picture or illustration of God is limited and wrong. And this one is no exception. But I'd like us to think about a thick rope. Here's my rope. And uh, it's woven from three strands. If you can see in the end there, there's three strands. It has a threeness and it has a oneness, as it were. I admit it's a very poor picture, but we could perhaps take these strands to indicate Father, Son and Holy Spirit. I even thought of colouring one of the strands red to indicate the crucifixion of Jesus, who shed his blood to set us free from our sins, opening the way for us to be born again. Something else I noticed about this rope. It is so strong, in fact, that even though you can see the separate strands, it's almost impossible to separate them. This rope has three equal strands. Now, a rope can become lopsided if one of the strands in it is thin or weak. A bit, perhaps, changing the metaphor slightly, a bit like a church can go lopsided if it forgets about the Holy Spirit or forgets about Jesus or forgets about the Father and only really teaches about one or two of the three members of the Godhead. And the church at Corinth perhaps were in danger of getting lopsided. They were confused and a bit chaotic in how they related to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, together. And sometimes when we talk about spiritual gifts, there's a danger that we think, what's in it for me? But that is to put things back to front. It should be all about God's glory, not ours. 
what does God want? And the work of the Holy Spirit is what you might call a floodlight ministry. He illuminates. And here's where my bike light comes in. He illuminates. Let's see if we can turn it on. Ah, yes, it's <laughs> blindingly bright, saturating the camera. Yes, there it is. And he illuminates. So if I wanted to illuminate uh, myself, well, oh, that's a bit, <laughs> a bit weird. Or this rope. You're conscious of the illumination on the object or on the person. And the Holy Spirit illuminates the Lord Jesus so that we can see him in all his glory. And as a result, we don't so much see the Holy Spirit. Just as at the moment, I can't really see the light because it's so bright, but the light is doing its job. It's it's illuminating uh, the rope. OK, let's turn that off. In preparing for today's talk, I've been reading a book called Keep in Step with the Spirit by J.I. Packer, author of Knowing God. And I came across a quote. It's quite a long quote, but I'd like to read it and I will put it on the screen so that you can follow along. Jim Packer writes this. What is the essence, heart and core of the Spirit's work today? What is the central focal element in his many-sided ministry? He goes on to say, The Spirit makes known the personal presence in and with the Christian and the Church of the risen, reigning Saviour the Jesus of history, who is the Christ of faith. I told you this quote was long. It continues. Scripture shows that since the Pentecost of Acts 2, this essentially is what the Spirit is doing all the time as he empowers, enables, purges and leads generation after generation of sinners that's us to face the reality of God and he does it in order that Christ may be known loved trusted honored and praised which is the Spirit's aim and purpose throughout as it is the aim and purpose of God the Father too this is what, in the last analysis, the Spirit's new covenant ministry is all about. Now, at Corinth, there were many idols. This one is actually, uh, I think it was found at Ephesus, not too far away. And Paul says in verse 2 of chapter 12, Somehow you were led astray when you were pagans to dumb idols and then he says no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says a curse is Jesus literally anathema Jesus we don't know why Paul says that perhaps he'd been asked about it anyway no one ever says cursed is Jesus and speaks by the Spirit of God. And no one can say Lord Jesus or Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So this means that to truly know Jesus as Lord or number one in your life requires the work of the living Holy Spirit. Now, continuing from verse 4, as we've seen already in our reading, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. Different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Then in verse 7, 
Now to each one. What a lovely phrase, to each one. So everyone gets to play, in John Wimber's phrase. To each one. The manifestation of the Spirit is given. What's it given for? For the common good, for the blessing of all, not just the gifts recipient. And then the wonderful uh, list of various spiritual gifts. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, and to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another faith, to another gifts of healing, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, to still another the, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one, just as he determines. So to summarise, there is a powerful Holy Spirit who is God himself. And this Holy Spirit gives spiritual gifts to each person who says Jesus is Lord. And we remember the floodlight ministry of the Holy Spirit as he illuminates and draws our attention to and gives honour to the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, there are a great variety of gifts, but the same Spirit who works in all of them. It's very exciting because everyone gets to play. If you feel that um, you're not getting to play, as it were, and or you don't know what your spiritual gift is, or maybe you feel God is moving you into some new season, and there might be something new for you. Uh, the dynamic Lord, the life giver, the Holy Spirit, he is uncontainable, like the wind. Um, then could I, again, encourage you, encourage myself to, to ask and to explore humbly and to be open to God's work. So let us ask expecting to receive and let us use whatever gift or gifts we receive to the glory of God. Amen. A closing prayer. Let's join in together. God of power, may the boldness of your spirit transform us May the gentleness of your Spirit lead us. May the gifts of your Spirit equip us to serve and worship you now and always. The blessing. May Christ's holy, healing, enabling Spirit be with us and guide us on our way at every change and turn. And the blessing of God Almighty Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us and remain among us always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.